Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Just mentioned Bob Olson was the host of the show, and many of the shows on the uh, radio network, and, uh, you know, just to offer up a prayer, we'll do one a Hail Mary, all of us together, because, you know, Bob is a a uh, great Catholic warrior who's done so much as a deliverance ministry. Um, he's just always upbeat, always in the spirit. You know, during these health problems, he just resigns uh, himself to God's will and is always cheerful and whatever God's will it is, you know, God's, uh, Bob's going to be good with that. So he's, he's quite a guy. So please keep him in your prayers because we want to... Um, you know, hope he's back on his feet and with us as soon as he possibly can. So let's do that. Hail Mary in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You know, speaking of such things is when we see uh, or have prayer requests from our friends, and they seem to be many when, you know, people dealing with cancer and all kinds of illnesses, um, tragedies. Uh, I just had a prayer request on uh, one of the Emmaus Brothers prayer lines that uh, another young uh, teenage suicide and the family and community is devastated because I guess this is a problem that's arising in this particular community that the uh, young kids are thinking about ending their own life. So we see this, and we see the, of course, shootings in Las Vegas that Sunday, um, all the news that we pick up, and especially when these um, instances like this hit close to home. Um, One of the men I met on that uh, Emmaus retreat uh, was a paratrooper in the special forces and of course he had other friends in the special forces and I guess one of his special force teammates his son uh, joined the military and became a special force person himself and he was leading uh, his unit in Africa and I don't know if it was an anti-poaching or what was going on there but they were ambushed and three of his men were killed he happened to survive so for him, that was a personal tragedy. And to make matters worse, during that same time frame, one of his Special Forces buddies was in Las Vegas with his wife, and you may have seen this on television, and his wife died in his arms because she was one of the ones shot. So when you, we see these things that get close to home in our own personal lives, because when we hear about it, earthquakes and hurricanes, and they don't affect us personally, and we see stuff, especially over in Europe or other things, it, it saddens us as human beings, fellow human beings, but it doesn't have that intensity is when it hits close to home. And for people even of faith, it can become a crisis of faith in that we struggle. We struggle with our personal sins. We struggle with the tragedies around us, why we're uh, following the Lord and, and the old uh, bad things happen to good people type of philosophy. We see that Catholics have the same amount of divorces, the same problems that all secular people have. And we wonder, you know, um, how can this be if we're following Jesus and we're trying to adhere to his commandments and, you know, expect the promises that he made to us? And for many people, this is very difficult, especially when these tragedies, these circumstances all these things, all this stuff, if you will, happen in our lives, especially if our, our, these tragedies include children or grandchildren in our uh, immediate family. And we, as human beings, are so used today to having answers for many of the problems that we have in lives, for many of the people that starve, for many of the people that have a cancer diagnosis, that have certain things go wrong in their lives and they are able to be outlets to have some of these problems rectified and taken care of. 
And even with our medical diagnosis, there's a way that we can um, have medical treatment and be helped. And this is important because God gives us these people and these talents and skills to be able to use these things for our benefit. So what I'm trying to get the point across is that when these things happen, that we are used as a society today to be able to try to solve these problems and have answers to problems that have perplexed people that in the past did not have an outlet to these certain types of problems. So we're used to that. So when things happen, like Las Vegas or these hurricanes or the earthquake in Mexico or those soldiers being ambushed. It's hard for us to deal with that a lot of times as human beings. And it's even harder, I think, sometimes to just throw our hands in the air and say, we don't have an answer. And that's hard. That's hard for me. And I would imagine it's hard for a lot of other people when the rubber hits the road that we have to let go and not have an answer. And that is very difficult. That is very, very difficult. Because it makes us take the eye off ourselves and turn it to the God in whom we believe. In other words, we take the trust that we've built up all our lives in ourselves and in our fellow man and we put it in the God of Israel and the God of creation. And that's not easy to do for a lot of us because it means, as I said, we have to let go. And sometimes when we cry out in prayer, there doesn't seem to be that answer that we want to, to want to hear that is. And we wonder if that prayer is even answered. But we know it is. I think deep down in our hearts, we know it is. And, you know, we can have some assurance of this because Jesus himself prayed for us when before his passion, he prayed for the disciples. And his prayer for his disciples and his followers is for us also. So when we have Jesus as an intercessor to the Father for us, we're in pretty good hands. And that can bring us some assurance and comfort. So when we have to throw our hands up in the air and let go, and despite all the times we want an answer and a clear cut and dried answer to a problem or a tragedy, and it's not forthcoming, we need to go back to Jesus and realize And I mean really search our souls and think and meditate on this. That Jesus overcame death. We talked about this a little last week. The good news of the gospel. And what is that? First, the gospel is about the birth, the life, death, and here it is, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we really need to meditate on that resurrection because it has important ramifications for every human being on this planet and those of us following the faith. Because when we sit and read scripture, it is so easy, so easy to get used to those miracle stories that Jesus weeps, but he will go to Lazarus' tomb and he will call him out and Lazarus, still bound in the wrappings, will come out. He will bring Jairus' daughter who the people mock Jesus because they know she is dead and this man is claiming she is just asleep and they deride him for it. But what happens? Jesus performs a miracle and raises her from the dead. And that's what we need to concentrate on because isn't that our fear? 
is that no matter what we accomplish here, no ma matter what we obtain here, there's a psalm that's in this, that speaks in Scripture that even those that acquire great wealth and a great name that will spread beyond the borders of where they live, that one day they too will sleep with their fathers and will be no more. Neither will their wealth, and even if people speak well, once they're sleeping with their fathers of their name and what they accomplished, they too will pass. And there's a lesson there for us. Because we strive so much to accomplish so many things that a secular world tells us is what our lives are supposed to be about, what we should expect in our life, and what we should acquire in that life, that we miss the main part of that psalm. Now, don't get me wrong. We need to have employment. We need to have food, water, and shelter. We need to take care of our children. We need the basics. We do. That's all part of the human experience. That's all part of being alive. And they're all good parts. But the trouble comes when they become a means to an end. And they become the sole reason of our existence. Because that can get us into trouble. Because then we don't store up treasures in heaven where the moths cannot eat them. And each one of us knows deep down, even if we try to hide it, even if we try to hide it, that no matter what happens here, no matter what joys we get here, no matter what we accomplish here, no matter what titles we accumulate here, and I'm not degrading any of this stuff, but no matter what we do, deep down in our hearts and in our spirit, and that's the important part, that spirit, we know that it's finite, that we are going to pass away. And our Western culture has a very difficult time dealing with death because it is for many people and for many Christians, it's a frightening topic. It means we are going to one day cease to exist on this planet, that we may not see our grandkids grow up we may not see our children grow up. That all the fine food and the entertainment and the music we listen to and the books we read and the laughter and joy we share with friends and family and the uh, ability to have, take care of pets and enjoy animal companionship all goes. And it is kind of scary because we don't know. We don't know if it's going to be 10 years old or it's going to be 100 years old when that moment comes. But come it will. And it is a sobering thought because life is an incredible gift from God. Do some people have, it seems, an abnormal amount of tragedy in their lives? Absolutely. There are poor and starving people. We in the United States are so blessed here to decide not if we're going to eat, but what and when. It's incredible. And there's other people in other countries don't even know if they're going to have a meal that day, that week, much or less in a couple hours when they first start getting hunger pangs. So life can be very tough for people, but it is still a joyous thing. The poor are very close to God. And they share what little they have. And many of them are joyful despite their very, very difficult existence. And the term hell on earth, for some people, it can be true. People that experience that abnormal tragedies. And I think we, we pretty much all in our lives know people like that if it's not ourselves in that story. And it's so difficult to see the joy. But... Many people have it, and life is a gift, and it is a good thing. And that's why we don't want to lose it. Because I would make a, a wager that if you took those aborted babies 
and ask each one a question, whether they would rather have been aborted or obtained life. I have a sneaking suspicion, even with all the travails of life, they would choose to be born and to live life as you and I know it, with all its hardships and yet with all its joys. So it's frightening for us to realize that this has all got to come to an end. Now, even more so, if you've had a lot of joy in your life, now, I don't believe personally that anybody that has walked this planet has not known suffering or hardship. I think we all have experienced this as human beings. It's part of the condition of original sin, and we're all caught up in that. One of the shows we did was on how sin is just not individual but social, how it affects each, not only each one of us individually, but everyone involved in our lives, and even those sometimes we don't know. And... When we see this, we need to realize that the answer to this is to look at that resurrection. Because to truly, the next time we hear the scripture verse about Lazarus, that story, we need to pay attention, or Jairus' daughter, or the big one, Jesus' passion, or Jesus willingly chose to die. You know, a lot of people, um, they debate, well, who was responsible for Jesus' death? Was it Pilate? How about the Pharisees? How about the Sadducees? How about those Jewish leaders? Was it the crowd, the crowd yelling and cheering to crucify him that chose to crucify Jesus rather than have Barabbas released? So who was responsible? You and I for our sin, Adam and Eve? True, all part of it, but Jesus himself is responsible for his death. And why? Because Jesus loves us so much, he willingly, and here's the key, Jesus willingly went to die for you and me and everyone else. So Jesus chose this. He took it upon his shoulders and chose this as his responsibility to defeat the true enemy. And it wasn't the Roman Empire. And despite the hatred of the Jews to the Romans when they were occupied, the real enemy, as he is today, is Satan, evil, sin, and death. And that's why we need to concentrate on the resurrection because I really want us tonight to dwell on the resurrection and what it means for us because it means we do not die and then become annihilated because when we fear death and when we fear our beautiful lives that are going to be ended one day what we're really fearing is total annihilation. We're gone. No more. Finished. Broken into a billion parts to be scattered into the wind and while maybe someday we'll be fondly remembered, we're not here. We're destroyed and there's nothingness. We've, like the scripture says, we're just like a little wisp of smoke. It comes, is seen for a bit, and blows away. And that's a hard thing for us to accept. And that would be a very hard thing to deal with in life if it were not for the resurrection. Because Jesus' resurrection takes care of all of that. We are not annihilated. No, quite the contrary. We are going to live again and in a better place and in a higher state and in a glorified body with our soul that will know no more pain, no more tears, no more sorrows, only joy and no more separation from God, our loved ones, or his creation. 
or his creatures. Now think about that. That's what makes all of our lives relevant and important in the decisions we make, the good ones and the bad ones. For Jesus, by his passion, has defeated death. What came in in the Garden of Eden now goes out on that wood of Calvary. Sure, we know a physical death here on earth. That's still part of the ramification of original sin. But the eternal part of our lives, the spirit that moves us, that is our personalities, that is that laughter, that is that joy, that is that prudence, that is that wisdom, that is that kindness, that is that gentleness, forgiveness, the counsel, all the gifts and fruits of the spirit. That's who we really are. It's not the body in the shell. And the body is important. It's a great gift from God. The ability to see, to hear. And to, for example, see the colors of the rainbow after a storm. Or to hear a beautiful symphony. Or a child's laughter. Or birds singing. To be able to touch and feel things. And taste all the goodness of a good apple or a steak dinner. And all these good things. The ability to smell aroma of, of coffee in the morning or flowers in the air in the spring. These are all great joys, and they're all part of our bodies that are important. But it is our spirit that makes us who we are. And deep down, what we truly be, what we truly, excuse me, want to be, that's our spirit. And that's why we need the grace from God to continue to live in that spirit by his gift of his grace, so we continue to mature and grow in all those good things that our spirit wants for us, even when we try to push them aside or push them away. It's still there because we want that eternity. We want to live the forever. And in our spirit, we know that this is how it was supposed to be, that there's something in us that knows life here, this finite, finite life, cannot be all there is. Our spirit tells us that there is more. And that's what Jesus has opened the gates of heaven to again for us. Thank God for that. So we are not annihilated. And we have to hold on to that. Because when we really truly believe in the resurrection of Jesus, it is the whole sole purpose of our faith. As St. Paul talks about in Holy Scripture, without that, this would be a total waste of time. That it's all for naught. That what we tra uh, chase is not true. And why would we even bother then? We should give in to all those temptations and desires that are in each one of our lives and not worry about what happens when we die. Because you know you will. Life is short. So grab for all the gusto, as the commercial used to say, before that happens to you. But our spirit, it tells us this is not so. That there's much, much more to this. Now, if you've been a follower of this particular show of the station, you know that we talk about the mystical and that this is a battle. So we know that Satan has brought this death and this evil into the world. You know, when we're talking about such a tragedy as uh, Las Vegas, this is evil. And, you know, people are afraid to call evil evil. You know, I guess one particular party had said that, uh, why even bother praying? So that doesn't seem to solve anything. We can pray all we want. This is going to happen again unless we enact this bill or do this or that. And once again, if, if we strip through the layers, we see it's all about what human beings can do to fix things, how we're going to solve the problem. And granted, God gives us the wisdom and gives individuals the help. But to say, what's the sense of praying? We can take it upon ourselves to enact measures to stop things like this. Wow, are you missing the boat? Because mankind is not going to snuff out evil because his adversary, especially if it's not acknowledged, the devil, 
You can't have a program, however well-intentioned it may be, that can stop evil, especially demonic evil, because it's of a supernatural um, origin. And therefore, it has to be met with and beaten back by another supernatural origin, and that is God. And that's what I meant by God came to defeat the true enemy, which is Satan and the death he brought and the carnage he brings with that sin. That's what Jesus came and died on Calvary for, to defeat that once and for all. So when we look at it at that perspective, it opens up a whole new avenue on how we look at things like that, at that supernatural realm. Because this is really what's at stake. Because our lives are short here, no matter what we obtain or what we accomplish. And, you know, I use a a quick analogy with sports. I mean, I love uh, baseball. I love sports. You know, some of the greatest athletes now, you know, you get to be 60 or 70, and they're passing away, and what they accomplished is awesome. They provided a lot of thrills. They were very skilled at what they did. But they will pass on, and there will always be new ones to put up on that pedestal and follow. So that, too, passes. Now, their records may be intact, but even there, some of them can be broken. But they're no longer, quote, on the playing field. And while they may have fond memories and be highly esteemed, they're not here. And there's always the new kid on the block to take over because life here is passing. And we need those constant diversions to remind us or take not to take our mind off, rather, the inevitability that we're going to die. And they are diversions, and they're popular ones, and I like them too. And that's part of the reason I do. They are diversions from the so-called real world of the tragedies and the life and death that we all know. But they pass. And that's why we've got to change our thinking, especially in the Western culture. We can't run away from death anymore. We need to face it head on and realize it happens. You know, other cultures, when they see babies die of starvation and their young children die for the same reason or diseases, they have no problem, unfortunately, realizing the fragility that is life. They see it day in and day out. And here in the Western world, we don't quite see that type of death from starvation on that type of plane, but it's there. And when we look at the supernatural realm and look at that resurrection and realize there's more, we will have a new perspective on death, which our Western culture tries to sweep under the rug. And that's not healthy. In my opinion, that's not healthy. Because when it comes calling, you've got to be able to deal with it. And you can't just deal with it on a human level and say, okay, you know, it's time to move on. We've got our families. We've got our jobs. You know, we love them, but we've got to move on. You have to, to heal, and you have to go on. Your loved ones, my loved ones, they'd want that. They wouldn't want you just sitting in a chair, you know, um, and just being moaning all the time about the deceased, your loved one. But it also we have to safeguard and say that we also know they're alive somewhere. Now, somewhere they're alive. And we pray and we hope and we offer masses if we're Catholic and we do those sacrifices and the fasting and all the prayers. So if they're in purgatory, they will go to heaven. And if they're in heaven, they will pray for us and we ask those prayers. And we ask for God's mercy. And it's important to do that. Because that's a healthier concept of death, is to realize that this isn't all there is. You're not annihilated. As St. Paul says, in a blink of an eye, you're on the other side when our time comes. And then it's for eternity. And we need to grasp that fact that our deceased loved ones and those that have gone before us are alive, as we will be. And the question is, where are we going to be? And that changes your perspective on life and the eternal life. Because now, when you look at it from that way, 
you're going to have to start to answer that question that Jesus asked Peter. Who do you say I am? Now, as believing Catholics, we believe that Jesus is who he said he was, God. And that God has risen from the grave. He is resurrected. And that means he is alive. And his followers are alive. And his blessed mother is alive. And as Catholics, we're blessed, so blessed, to see that some person that died so many thousands of years ago, and I'm talking about the Virgin Mary now, has appeared in such places in the 1800s, in the Rue de Bac, with the miraculous medal, in Lourdes, with St. Bernadette, in Guadalupe, in Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico in the 1500s, when the Protestant Reformation was taking place, and then all the Catholics came from North America to replace those who were lost in Europe after uh, Our Lady's apparition in Guadalupe. In our modern times here, we see Fatima, which is so relevant for today. And that was in 1917 during the carnage of World War I. Bottom line here is that if this Virgin Mary, who died so many thousands of years ago, is appearing through the centuries after that, it means there's life after death. For those who have seen ghosts, or have heard about ghosts, or are intrigued by ghosts. Here's the point to remember. If this is a legitimate supernatural experience, and many are, of a ghostly appearance, that means there is life after death. And it's not something to be afraid of, or the movies like the Poltergeist, where it becomes a horror film but truly to realize that the meaning of this, of these ghostly um, appearances, are that people, human beings, you and me, live after our earthly life. And when we truly take that to heart and spirit and truly turn and answer that question in our heart and spirit, who do you say that I am, that's going to change the entire perspective in the way we live our lives. And that's why it's so important to realize what that resurrection means for us because it is everything in the faith. Because it means that the ramifications after our death are eternity in the final judgment of either hell or heaven. And it's going to change our lives, or it should, if we're wise. And we should pray for that wisdom. And... When we look at it from that perspective, it's going to enable us, through the gift of this grace we talked about, and through the fruit of the Holy Spirit, that it's going to give us the ability to try to repent and amend our lives. And for me especially, and for most human beings, I would venture, change is the hardest thing for us to do, especially if we've had a successful or joyful life the way we've been going, and now we're asked to do a 180. Boy, is that tough. Boy, is that tough. But in the end, it will be so much, much more worth it. And it's a step-by-step process when we change. It's like that diamond in the rough, that piece of coal that eventually become a diamond, but it takes time. It takes honing. It takes a long period of time to get to that state. And that's what the spiritual journey is and this battle is for us. It's not like we wake up one morning, I made it, man. Wow, I'm there. I got it. It's not like that at all. It's a step-by-step process. And sometimes we backslide and we slip. And it seems many times it's one step forward, two steps back. But the key is the perseverance. Christ tells us that in Scripture. He who perseveres will be saved in the end. And that's what's critical for us to remember is that we have to keep trying. We have to keep focusing on Jesus, no matter how dark, even if that light is just a little flicker that's in front of us, we've got to try to grab onto it and run with it. And we've got to keep trying to do the best we can. As Catholics, we're blessed to have the sacraments, and we're blessed to have the sacrament of confession, where we can go to confess our sins when we slip up and start brand new, filled with sanctifying grace. 
The key is to keep going and not despair, because that's also a trick of the devil, that he gets us to despair where we just give up because we're just lowly sinners, not worthy of anything of God, so just throw in the towel, and that's when he's got you. So we've got to be very careful of that despair because Christ doesn't want that. He's always there for us. Because, you know, even if we abandon him, the beauty of God's love for us is that he never abandons us ever. And he never will. He never will. He wants us with him. And he gives us all kinds of graces to continue that journey. We just have to pray in the Spirit to be open to them. So it's important to remember to hang on to the resurrection and realize that at the end of life, it's not annihilation, but it's a better life. But we also have to do our part. Jesus has done his. And that's the unfinished business we say Paul talks about on the cross. We still have to fulfill some stuff. That's our part. That's our part. We've got to work to continue to bring the kingdom of God that when Jesus came, initiated, and then through his paschal mystery, We've got to do our part to keep striving to get to that and filling in those gaps. And we can do that, of course, by loving God and then loving our neighbor as ourselves. And that's also very difficult. For human beings, and I don't know and I hope not in your family, but maybe you've heard someone or even in your own families, unfortunately, about people that haven't talked to each other in 15, 10, 20 years because of something that happened. And however justified each person thought, they were going to take that pattern and that course of action. And boy, you know, how tragic it is on someone's deathbed where they'll even continue to do that and hold on to that grudge and never let go and take that with them to the grave and how sad that is and how tragic that is. And that's one thing we want to pray for is that we need that spirit of forgiveness and we need to forgive as Jesus told us if we want the forgiveness that he offers. Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we should really adhere to that because we need to do that. We need to have a spirit of forgiveness. You know, think about how wonderful it would be in this world if we had that spirit of forgiveness and what a different world this place would be. It would be so awesome. And you know, it all starts with us. It all starts with us if we can start to do that. And that would be great. So I would recommend that, you know, maybe today we start to forgive that one person or many people, if it's the case, from our heart and begin to pray for them. And we will go from there. So when we are experiencing these very difficult moments in tragedy, rather I think sometimes, and I'm not saying not to look for answers, to try and stop things from happening again, or to find cures for illnesses or sicknesses and diseases. It's not what we mean. But when we can't have an answer, rather than get frustrated and angry over that, I think what we need to do is to just turn to Jesus in that resurrection. Realize, as hard as it is for us, that his ways are not our ways. And let go and trust in him. And I mentioned Bob, you know, uh, going through those health issues. That's a, a fantastic thing. Bob is such a great man of faith and has such deep faith. He's able to do that. Now, for a lot of us, including me, it, it's not that easy. But for guys like Bob that are so spiritual and in, uh, walk with the Lord for so long, it's easier for them. And it's a great witness to faith. And they have a peace amongst them that a lot of us don't get because of that. And while, you know, I, I still think a lot of, my mother was a great, uh, great woman of faith, death is still a scary part for a lot of people. A lot of people. I think it was for her a little bit. But, you know, when you're like that, you don't fear it as much as some other people because that fear is very real. And we can see this in the way our culture deals with it. 
and we escape. I mentioned sports. That may be a harmless escape. Some of the others, like alcoholism, pornography, drug abuse, are not. They're destructive and can lead to people's demise. But we all deal with this in different ways. Because, again, even if we push it under the rug, we know deep down it's there. No matter what joy or what thrill we have, it cannot last. It's going to end, and we will be separated from that. But what we don't want is to be separated from God in eternity. And that's why we've got to reshift our focus. And we're going to be able to not fear death as much. And I don't know if we'll get to the stage where St. Francis used to call it Sister Death, but, you know, we can start to kind of gather that in a little bit for ourselves where we will fear it less. And maybe some individuals that have such grace and such great deep faith in God, they can, uh, you know, push right past through that. I remember one gentleman that I kind of knew a little bit, and I remember uh, he ended up with pancreatic cancer, and he knew it was his time. And I'll never forget when there were people talking to him. He said, well, I'm going home. And he believed it. You can look in his eyes. I'm going home. I'm going home to Jesus. He was a man of great faith and who followed Jesus. And he had no fear at all. He, it was, I would almost say he looked like he was looking forward to it. And wow, I was thinking, you know, wow, is that faith. My gosh, this guy is really, he, he's going home. And what a great witness that was. You know, and peace that it brought him because that's one thing you can get. When you resign yourself, so, and don't forget, in Jesus' humanness, he had that agony in the garden. Remember he prayed, Father, if it be your will, spare this cup for me, because he knew that it wasn't going to be good. And that is a great understatement on my part. And he knew that. And if there was another way, Jesus in his humanness, like all of us, wanted to take that way. But and in his humanness, just what we're talking about tonight, he resigned himself to the Father's will, and the angels came and ministered him. And he went through that for us. Again, Jesus willingly chose this for us. And that is so awesome when you really, really think about that, that he willingly did this. And he showed us the way to overcome all the anxiety and fear we have. Because Jesus' prayer in the agony in the garden, isn't it true that it's our prayer and our suffering? Father, if there be this another way, take this cup. Take this cup I'm suffering now and give it another way. And in the end, we may have to resign ourselves to the Father's will because that's our humanness. And Jesus experienced all that. But he trusted. And those angels came and ministered to Jesus. And he went through what he had to. And when it was over, he took the worst thing that human beings have ever done in the history of our existence, killing God, and turned it into the greatest victory we'll ever see. You know, and that's why we call it Good Friday, right? Because the worst evil that was done by us, and we've done some, turned into our best advantage that we could ever have hoped for, that the gates of heaven would be opened up and not sealed forever. And how awesome is that? These are the type of things when we look in Scripture and we talk to our spiritual directors and we pray to see uh, with the eyes of the Spirit in the supernatural realm that we can be led to see how we can have this peace that Jesus talked about. Because Jesus knew full well and told his apostles they would have anxiety and trouble in this world, but to have confidence for he had overcome it. And isn't it ironic that when the Pharisees were deriding Jesus 
and taunting him to come down off that cross, then we'll believe you're the Son of God. And they never saw the fact that this was the Messiah who came to defeat their and our greatest enemy, the devil, and that the instrument he chose was one that was the most dreaded and the cursed, if you were a Jewish uh, man or woman, was the crucifixion. And that's the method he chose, and they missed it completely. And so can we, because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that this is how God the Father, the all-powerful God who created the universe and the stars and all this we see, would lower himself to become one of us, die for us, and go through all that agony and torture. It just doesn't fit the script that we're used to if we write the movie. We would want just what the Jewish people wanted that time, a warrior king to come down and give the Romans what was long overdue and make things right and bring justice to all. The only problem is God, again, being so much wiser than we, knows that even if that happened, it would be a short-term fix because of the nature of original sin and the nature of the supernatural battle, there would always be a new oppressor. There would always be that proclivity, that concupiscence, as St. Augustine said, that, that means leaning towards sin that is in each and every one of us. And that's why it's so important to realize why Jesus came to defeat the true enemy. Because no matter what system we come up with as human beings, there will always be that concupiscence, that leaning towards sin that will cause one individual, whether they be in power or seeking power, to usurp any good authority and overturn it with theirs. And that's the danger that all human beings have had and will have until that final judgment. That's why it's important to see the cross in that new light and what it really accomplished and who it really defeated as an enemy. Because it is a great danger, and we see it in the modern world, both here in the United States and in Europe and all over, that to, the devil is not even acknowledged as an enemy, as he, as he even exists anymore. Neither does hell. And that is a classic mistake to make in any type of warfare, but especially spiritual where you don't know your enemy. If you don't know your enemy and those temptations that the devil uh, is throwing at us and you try to uh, pass that off as some type of behavior that you acquire as a child or this is just the way you are and you can't change or the many excuses why we do the things we do, we're not acknowledging that these temptations and this evil come from the devil. And therefore, we're unprepared to really get at the heart of the matter to defeat that. Because don't forget, we as human beings, we cannot overcome death and we cannot overcome sin. Not by ourselves, but through Jesus Christ, we overcome death and we have the ability through Jesus to overcome that sin that leads to death. And that's the important part to remember. But we need to know that in order to do that, we need to know that the enemy is the devil. And that way, when those temptations come, we will see where they're coming from, and we will be better off to fend it off, if not completely destroy it. And the more we do that, the better we're going to get out of it, get, get at it. Now, it doesn't mean we're not going to fall. That's why we have that great gift, and Jesus knew this. He gave us that gift of confession, because he knows that we're going to sweat but the key is we grow and grow and get better and better and our bigger sins become not the ones we were committing a couple of years ago. And then we try to turn away completely from the mortal sins that lead to death. And the venial sins then we try to work and make those better. And if we've got that spirit of unforgiveness, we try to get the spirit of forgiveness. And if we have a spirit where, let's say, we gamble, we like to gamble over excessively, where we're wasting our paychecks and not paying the bills, 
that we have a spirit that can overcome those type of addictions because we all have some type of addictions that we have and through the grace of God we can overcome them and grow in our spirituality still realizing we're going to slip still realizing we're not going to be perfect on this side of the planet we will in heaven and that's our goal but we will grow and grow because one of the great gifts that the saints get is that they realize they are sinners. And when we look at someone like St. Paul or St. Teresa of Lisieux or any of these saints, one of the things that they realize, they were horrible sinners, especially St. Francis. And we look at them and say, wow, how can that be? St. Teresa, St. Therese, Mother Teresa, St. John Paul the Great, but they knew they were. And that's the key that you're growing and we're growing in holiness is to realize, yeah, we are. And through the grace of God, we need him desperately. And that's how we grow. And we'll lean on him more and trust in him more. And that's important in our spirituality, our growth. And that's what Jesus has done for us and given us. But we need to focus on that resurrection because this is all about that supernatural. And we need to concentrate on that mystical. And that means with the nature of mysticism, and mystical things, we are not going to have all the answers, and we have got to accept that, and that is tough. But we have to. We have to. And one good plus about starting to believe like that is we're going to start believing more in the miracles that we see and hear about, and there are plenty of them. Plenty of them. Jesus has given lots of miracles, and we're going to look at our lives in a different way. And when we're open to the spirit like that, we're going to see the spirit moving in our lives and we're going to start having mystical experiences and they're going to be legitimate and other people are going to see that and we're going to come in context with people that are versed in this and are going to help us in our spiritual growth and these are so important for us to realize and we can get that mysticism by that prayer that we've talked about on several shows that quiet time in that prayer where we just listen to God and we just commune with him and let him do the talking, let him do the leading. And then when we resign ourselves to that, especially during those tough parts when we're on the cross, when we're nailed up on that cross with Jesus, and it is not easy to be still and quiet and listen, we're going to get that grace and that's going to help us. That's going to help us a lot, in addition to all those people praying. And that's why folks, you know, like Bob, the trials and the crosses he's undergoing now, it's important to pray so that that spirit can continue to flourish in people like Bob's lives or anyone undergoing, undergoing any type of crosses is that we need to do this so that we can keep on the track and keep on growing and keep on heading to that wonderful moment when we meet Jesus face to face. And that's going to happen. That's going to happen. And it doesn't, it's not going to matter what we've obtained then. It's going to matter what we did here and how well we loved. Because that's what uh, Jesus talks about. You know, those cardinal, cardinal verses what we have. When we, when we talk about the faith, hope and love. We know that St. Paul says that love is the greatest of these. And it's also a very difficult thing because as human beings, we get used to each other, we get used to our spouses, we get used to our family members. It's so easy to take things for granted. So easy, especially each other. I, mean, I do it all the time. You know, it, it's, a, it's something I've got to pray for where I don't do that because that's not a good thing to do. It's not a good thing to do we need to know and really pray to see the uniqueness in each and every one of our lives, especially those in our family who we get so used to that they're all God's creatures and they're unique in their own right that he created in a special and grace-filled way. Because I think it's an awesome thing that the God of creation knew right now that you and I would be conversing about him when whoever's listening to this and meet my, my birth, 
he knew this would happen. I mean, how, how awesome is that? How mystical is that? How mystical is that? And I mean, I, that is truth. That is truth. And that is incredible. I mean, can, can we really wrap ourselves around that? That the God of all creation knew at the, when he did this whole thing that you and I, on this Wednesday evening, would be talking about this from the moment of our conception? <laughs> wow. Man. And that's the type of childlike wonder we need to have to see through the eyes of eternity when we look at the resurrection and realize that we live after this life. And that those hardships and those crosses that seem that they have no use at all, that they're completely void of anything good, may have the greatest good that we could have ever imagined in our lives. Wow. Wow. Another awesome thing. It's just incredible when you think about it, which is makes this so exciting and makes our lives so exciting because when you look at it, when you look at this mystical uh, experience that we have or that we have the ability to have as human beings, it sends us on an adventure in our wildest imaginations we could have never guessed. An adventure that will take us to being with our Creator in his kingdom forever and total joy and peace. And in the interim before that, we have this adventure and this roller coaster ride that we call life that gives purpose to our lives and meaning to our lives and success, true success to our lives, especially when we open our hearts to the love of Christ and then Jesus can use us as instruments to bring others to that hope in him. And that is a successful life. And that is exciting because it puts us on a place we could never imagine, not in our wildest dreams. And that's what the supernatural is all about. It's all about letting that spirit blow where the spirit wants to. And that doesn't necessarily mean where we want it to go. And that may take some getting used to. But if we trust in God and we just put our lives in his hands, it's like that old Allstate commercial. If you're old enough to remember Allstate insurance, you're in good hands with God. So that's what we want to to remember and pray for this. So once again, as we close out tonight, as you go through your week, especially if you're having some tough moments, concentrate, meditate, and really Ask Jesus to open your heart to the meaning of the resurrection and what life after death truly means. And please keep Bob and all those you know suffering in your prayers. And may God bless you. And remember, he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Good night. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.